Greetings ladies and mentalgens and welcome to this patch video for There is no Epic Lucha, Holy Puns from Royal Road. This video will contain chapters 109 to 111 and as always I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 109 Quickies and Squiddies Alpha, Delta sat down heavily. Alpha was endurance. Listen, before you start rolling out the red carpet, just remember we don't know anything about him. He's ignoring sis, so something's up. Don't. Just be careful. Delta sat on the second floor near the waterfall, nodding slowly. But, what if he's been looking for me, or one of us? I made a home here with you and my friends, Alpha. He sounds lonely. Delta tried to explain her wild state of mind. And we have no idea if that's a good reason or not. Data blew out of sight. Damn it! She just wanted to rush out there and talk to the guy. He... He would come to a dungeon, hopefully. Once he heard her name, Data knew that he wouldn't be able to resist. Data certainly couldn't have. What if he was cooler than her? Oh. What if he knew so much more and Data looked like a dolt? What if Alpha thought Delta was a letdown? I'm going to talk to him, because, lonely or not, Alpha is family in a way. We have to communicate, because he could risk him running into a silence unprepared. Maybe he's alone, because people keep thinking something's wrong with him. Delta protested. A friendly chat is fine. Inviting him to your call room, or giving away your secrets upon first meeting him, not so fine. New no, made sense. He seemed to be grumpy about the whole thing. You're worried his menu is cooler than you, aren't you? She asked, sympathetic. New no, when still. I have no issues with my existence. I shall go to the third floor and continue watching the problems and looking into ideas. Plans set into motion are best kept an eye on. Please contact me at your leisure, Dungeon Core. New no, vanished and Delta was there blinking. That was blunt even for New. Delta hoped Alpha's menu sucked. New could really use the confidence boost. Alpha coming here would only do two things. It would make the differences clear, and it would also show how much Alpha had progressed in his power compared to Delta. New really shouldn't care for anything else. New blinked back. He looked at the purple as if red in his face. It was a weird for a screen. I can't do this. I am not one drawn out for stupid drama. Listen, I have an issue with Alpha because I am concerned. I, the dungeon will fall to the wayside if your priorities. That you'll force me and everyone to listen to some stranger because he came from the same place as you. Delta thought about it. If Alpha hung around her near town, they would have lots of reason to talk and hang out if the personalities meshed. Would she start telling her monsters that Alpha had some sane things, or to put up with the system not quite working due to the human in her dungeon? Delta didn't think so, but she was impulsive, and she knew that she tried to please people. If Alpha needed EXP or treasure, would she spend valuable DP on making something unique for him? Delta admitted that she had no idea. Okay, I can see why you're getting worried. How about a deal? Delta clapped her hands together and it was a waterfall gushed, sounding like an endless yawn. If I want to help Alpha or such, we need to agree on it together. And if we don't, we'll just get a voting council on the matter. We need a wise and fair monster to handle it so that they don't just agree because I'm me, Delta suggested. It isn't about res- Okay, I can agree to that. Farah, Delta began. Farah was my pick as well. Hmm, Davina and Farah are my pick, Delta said. New was quiet for a long time. Doctor and Wyan. Delta raised one brow. Doctor's mad gargoyle of science. He can stay close to the true rational thought occasionally. Wyan has a more independence than most, even if I dislike her. And she wouldn't bend to please you, especially if it meant hurting you in the long run. Davina is the law of the jungle and likes balance. Farah doesn't give a heck and will say what needs to be said, Delta agreed. Thank you for agreeing to this. It wasn't what I was worried about, but it goes a long way. New vanished again. Delta huffed. What are you so worried about then? She flailed her hands in the air. Delta guessed that was it for today. The dungeon had its council of monsters. Go democracy! 
Dada said, with a sigh. She stood, petting Bob, who was nearby, sunbathing as he did occasionally. Bob, wish me luck. I'm going to meet my brother of another dimension while setting up a council of voters made up of a barmaid, a jungle witch doctor, a mad scientist, and a murder tree. She smiled. Bob made a slight shriek, showing that he was proud of Dalta's efforts and that he loved her. Oh, Bob, you're the best abyss worm that I could have ever asked for. Dalta hugged him. She did her best to hold him before she went right back to see how the kids, plus Kemi, were getting on. Delta, Alpha said, voice hitching slightly. Haldi, the weird man, hummed, pretending not to notice Alpha's tone. Yep, new dungeon that popped up recently. The core is a lively girl who doesn't much care for kidding or such. She sounds like such a sweetheart. Haldi grinned, showing a gap with his smile. Was it a coincidence? Maybe it was spelled differently or just sounded close enough to give Alpha pause. He looked at his map screen, which showed the grey fog of war around the areas that he hadn't been. No symbol of anything important. He looked at the public buildings before him. Page Turner's bookshop, he said quickly. Aldi nodded, and Alpha got some large experience for simply telling the man about the place he obviously knew. This man was giving Alpha so much EXP that his simple task that hidden level he saw was like a ghostly fog about people's heads. It was black. Black was death, black was unbeatable. Most royal guard knights varied between red, purple, and black. But Hall was black, as was Zane. The stronger the quest giver, the more EXP Alpha got. Even for the same tasks, the gain was too different to ignore. But before Haldi just, just didn't give him a task, the man's essence didn't want anything from Alpha. Alpha couldn't gain EXP. It was unnerving. No one had ever asked him to do something for anything besides his own benefit. Even it was kind of a bit of petty work. Someone got a deal out of it. Aldi's essence looked tired of requests. It took some effort for Alpha to convince the man to do one. He wondered how many quests this Aldi had done to gather so much power. Normal people could transfer essence as well. Alpha could see it, sometimes. People bend some pride and pass their woes onto someone else, bet some essence from their core. If the person completed it, the dark essence flowed to a person who completed the quest, as if the energy sought the stronger person. XP didn't appear from nowhere. It was an energy transfer. There were some rules. Working for a boss or a leader did not transfer energy. The admission of agreeing to work for someone stronger for basic needs seemed to negate the process. However, the general or commander leading a troop of warriors gathered small amounts of essence from each subordinate during the battle. The warriors produced it by following, while the leader gained it by shouldering the command. Tiny, but when spread over a hundred men or more, the result was a little insane. It was like some weird faith thing, as if belief and confidence in a superior being you trust your life with was powerful. Alpha saw the same result in the efficient girl leaders and heads of various churches. Faith had power and Alpha was a little afraid of it. He could understand people. Just get them. He would be able to lead people or have them look up to him and generate a kind of bond like he saw, but... Alpha couldn't. He couldn't lead people in the middle of a battle and have a demon child getting bored of him and making him gone. The people would be left, and Alpha would be to blame for whatever fell on them. Alpha wasn't comfortable having the deaths on himself, getting foes, assassins, mindless beasts. He felt nothing for, but people who trusted him, it would be upsetting. Of course, getting someone also transferred essence in a much grander scale. Complete and utter transfer. Alpha knew that it was limited, though, since faith gain was constant while killing had stop gaps until the next fight. But given the fact that he couldn't get someone to follow him with any sense of actual faith, Alpha had no other choice but to collect trash and kill people. He couldn't risk stopping. He could never risk stopping. Something entered his mouth and Alpha chewed automatically, flavor bursting over his tongue. Cheer up, kid. Not everything is so gloom and doom, Haldi winked. Well, why are you so strong? Alpha asked, swallowing the delicious cheese, deciding to keep the Delta question for another time. Haldi grinned. 
Well, when I was a sprog, I adventured with three people. Snappy, Stabby, and Huggy, and me. Stinky, he guffed. Alpha mentally penned the names down for later. He added Stinky to Aldi's mental profile, and he built on all important people. We did dungeons, we sailed to the four sea edges. I even climbed down one side on a dare. Damn well nearly fell into the abyss. One time we battled a mysterious woman who could teleport. Me and her had a, uh, close friendship, where we slept in the same bed like night buddies. Aldi laughed nervously. She was your conquest. Alpha nodded, already hearing his Sam Zayn more often than not. No, I was her treasure, her personal room guardian. I was her reminder of being ent... Aldi cleared his throat. He walked a little faster as bits of the wood spears began to rain down on the town. They turned to sword us before they hit anything. Anyway, the point is, the way to gain experience is to have good friends at your back and a goal. He summed up from some pale man under umbrella, began to collect the bets on the various villages and the winner of the fight happening outside of the town. He was again ranked black. This town had a lot of strong people. Was there some event in arena matches? Von, a golden holly. Support the home team, Haldi nodded. The man grinned. I'd say a sucker's bet, but I have some real sucker bets on my time. Some just taste better when you win their necks. The man looked at the girl at his side. Bite me and I'll ram a stake in your rear. The girl warned, looking tired of the, the vampire. Oh, I do love a bit of tomfoolery, the vampire mused. Go, honey. Look how beautiful my wife is. She is at her best when she's trying to rip someone's throat out. A man with glasses looked a little starstruck at the battle in the distance. Haldi pushed him on before the odd people could interrupt them any further. Can you take me to Delta? He asked, and he winced as some of his essence was siphoned from the quest. Not much, but every little bit of him seemed back. His essence was white instead of people's normal black. Haldi perked up. I would love to help you. Come on, we can see if the rascals have already gone in. He mused and Alpha didn't care much for children, but he had to know if this Delta was something posing. He rubbed his head with a number one and burned into his skin, hidden mostly in his hair. Alpha needed to meet Delta, and he needed to meet the person who could control their power enough to make a fort on monsters, to act like a dungeon and gather power. Alpha wanted to meet his successor, just to know what he lacked. Dio pushed out the large wall and began to slide back. Kemi quickly moved to get out of the path as Dio had let it go. The pig's eyes lit up as a weak laser beam shot out, barely missing him. It was so cool, the room guardian could shoot lasers, glow and burp steepy gas, and sometimes smell really delicious. Still, Dio had a job to do, and he had to do it. Bone shackles caused Bori and the room guardian to stumble slightly before the pig broke free. It gave enough time for Dio to slash his sword flatways across the bloor's flank. Dio, harmless slaying edge, he roared. The snapping noise vibrating in his hand, the pig obediently stumbled and turned at him while Dio hopped back. Bori even limped a little now in response. His acting was so good, Dio had to recruit him for the school play somehow. Uh, um, truth, Squishy Hammer? Kemi called out uncertainly as a wonky-looking glowing hammer appeared over Bori. Squishy feebly into his head. Awesome! Dio cheered and almost missed Grim in the distance hopping back as an arrow after arrow chased him, hitting the ground hard enough that it would bruise skin. Gotta run out of arrows soon, Grim said, panting. The weird arrow landed nearby and exploded in a hiss of purple mist, covering Grim as he began to splutter. Blue-style rock wings, Poppy announced. Her back exploded with brown wings that were bigger than Dio. She flapped hard and the mist was blown away to reveal a slight confused Grim. Always knew wind energy was the way to go, Grim said before wiping his mouth. Dio guessed that he must have been into the battle so much that he didn't even notice his own joke. Bori glowed and rolled, his energy beams hitting nearby mushrooms and spiraling arcing, causing minor explosions. 
Oddly, the really dangerous mushrooms had all been eaten before they arrived, so while the ear was flung forward, the blast wasn't that bad. Something moved along the mushroom stalks above Dio, and he saw Bori rushing to tackle him again. Tusks carefully aimed so that the points wouldn't skewer him. Dio stood, holding his sword in a stance that he had only seen his father do with a much bigger sword. Dio wanted to be just like his dad, the master of swords and metal, but in a way that he didn't actually hurt anyone. The sword was a straight edge so that he had to hold it awkwardly. He hummed a little and focused on the feeling as it traveled down his arms and into his blade. His father could make it vibrate at such a frequency he'd cut stone. Dio could make it move enough to scratch a tree. Then again, Dio had never used it on anything other than a real sword's edge. Trees didn't deserve to be cut down for no good reason. Trees made air and air was good. The sword hummed and Dio felt it sing to him through his hand. It sang in a lovely whistle and cheer. I'm ready to push, but not harm. That's what Dio felt the sword say to him. Unlike his fists, Dio was very good at hearing swords. Dio couldn't hear his fists in the same way. It felt like a deep muffled ocean when he tried to feel his own strength. Dio pushed off the ground, sending a slight spray up into the air, swords swinging from the side. Boris' tusks seemed to do something strange. They curled in a wispy orange energy. It was like it wanted to show Dio some kindness and use a technique. Singing Blade Monday Melody, he said, making up a random name for the movement. They moved past each other in a rush of dust and wind. Dio watched as a single tusk of Bori came clean off. He knew his sword wouldn't lie to him, but Bori turned and looked pleased. His animal eyes almost twinkling before it kneeled down and died. But had Bori forced his tusks into the blade, Dio's own sword made a weird sound and cracked in half as well. Oh, now we needed a new sword. And he turned to Tusk, began to pulse, and Dio picked it up. Tusk had a sword handle. It was shorter than Dio's normal blade, but only because it was curved. Dio looked at Bori. How did he drop loot when he wasn't dead? In a weird way, the sword was more like a club unless Dio intentionally stabbed. He grinned, turning to show his prize off when he saw Grim pushing against the dark goblin with its hood up. Glowing red eyes and a grin were the only things visible under the hood. Then daggers clashed and Poppy appeared with large claws, but the goblin cackled, using some kind of hook to pull himself back into the mushroom ceiling out of the sight. Dio wanted to help, but then hesitated. Grim looked so determined and desperate. Grim wanted to win this fight. Dio slowed down, turning to explain himself only to find Amonster and Kemi already sitting nearby, watching with interest. Dio grinned. His group was so damn in sync. Go Grim, go Poppy, he cheered his heart out. That idiot was cheering his damn heart out. Grum didn't need the support, he accepted it to be polite. Billy had learned some new tricks. Billy had grown some new threads. Billy had evolved. This put a whole get revenge and respect thing into a slightly harder goal time frame. He moved, already expecting the arrow body that followed. All the arrows were blunter than Dio's surprise parties. Still, they hurt like being struck by a rock. Poppy vanished with a girl that wasn't bad as backup even if she appeared like an ambush predator more than a mage at times. Grim guessed that it was the whole blue mage thing. Be a mage, act like a beast. The issue that he had was that Billy had the upper hand in both environment and ambush tactics. Fire was off limits and was cutting the mushrooms down. There was simply far too many of them. He needed to get on Billy's level. As if answering on a wing and a prayer, Poppy appeared bat wings flapping. Grim was sure that when blue mages used techniques, the parts vanished, actually retaining a monster's form, was not part of a blue mage package. Hold on, I'm getting annoyed by this India. Everyone is watching, she grimaced. Right, the purple mage thing, Grim forgot about it. This girl never showed it off, and all Grim wondered why. 
They flew up higher and higher until they breached the mist. Poppy stilled and let go and zoomed off after the goblin ahead. Who took pot shots with the arrows? Grim used the coat like blankets without a piercing edge. The coat was a decent shield for a moment. Get ready. If you can hold on to him for a moment, I can take him down like a vermin and entangle him. Poppy hissed like a weird snake. Grim didn't exactly get a say in the matter, as Poppy dropped him like a dragon rider dropping explosive potions on foes. He assumed Billy didn't exactly respect Grim more for it when he landed on him with a heavy thump mid-jump, and they both fell back to the grove's floor, mushrooms acting like springy pillows. Oi, get off! Billy grumbled, but with a swift double kick to the stomach, Grim was pushed over. Grim knew his role and charged, throwing all respect out the window and grabbing Billy's legs, making the goblin trip and drop his hook thing. Their eyes met in the primal understanding passed between them. This was no fight for tools or fancy skills. They were beasts. Claws and teeth were good enough. This would be a battle between man and goblin, between dungeon and free, between Grim and Billy. But the wrench in the plan came when a squid monster fell from a tree and both of them screamed, holding each other. Purple-style brain-sucking Mahandi squid. The beast growled. Did we win or did we draw? Kemi asked, looking disturbed as the half-girl, half-squid monster. Go with win, why blemish our record? Amonster asked with an amused smile. Dio looked in awe. Poppy is so cool! He almost squealed. Kemi closed her eyes and put an image into the midlife crisis compartment of simply nodded, smiling and humoring. Squid girls were cute now. They had to be or Kemi would cry. Quiss frowned. Why was he in the middle? Quiss never really mentioned you, Rudy said smoothly from left. Zane, of all people, was on his right sipping a drink. I don't expect Quiss to mention me. Not much to write about. Zane said simply, looking right back at Rudy with an amused eyes. The bar they sat at had a wide space around them as people avoided getting close. He tried to get up, but their auras were like weights on his shoulders. He was still holding them back from fighting. Zane, you tried to kill me, then presented me with letters asking for one night stands. But instead of your usual crap, you wanted to kill me and leave me. Rudy... You did sleep with me, and I hated you ever since. Can we move on like... Why are you here, Zane? Quiss gritted his teeth. Dungeon taxes something wasn't paying attention. Zane admitted, scratching his chin. It wasn't that bad in bed. You just got my horses going, Rudy frowned. It was the scariest sexual encounter that I have ever had, and I've slept with people who could kill me. People that have tried to kill me, and people I'm sure did kill me before bringing me back. You were the scariest, Quiz said flatly. Quiz says that you're a painting of joy and pinching circled into a circle and then on set on flame. Life shifting but soul snapping, Seth said as he walked past. Zane looked at him with a confused expression. Who the hell are you? The man grunted. Seth eyed him with a long look. Beyond your reach and your night pictures, Seth said coolly. Seth, why don't you sleep with me and see if Quiz is being a drama queen? Ruly offered, Seth blinked. I do not feel good about putting you to the end to make Quiss a royal. I like you, Seth frowned. Ruly made an obscene gesture that made Seth's eyes light up. Ah, you wish to mingle bodies, I must advance you. I am a master of affectionate bedsheets. Seth winked. The dirty talk is going to be so amazing. I might actually die, Ruly grinned. Oh no. Be careful, Seth, Quiss said bored before turning to Zane. Can you maybe kill me quickly? He asked. Zane was unimpressed. I don't do quickies, he said offended. Neither does Rudy. Right. Whatever. I'm going to stop a druid and a glutton knight from fighting. It's easier than uh, this. Quiz stood up leaving the bar with his large staff and hat. Zane shrugged and ordered another five pints. He might as well get blasted before he actually had to work. Less chance of him either killing someone or annoying someone strong enough to do kill him instantly. Zane didn't like quickies. So impersonal. End of chapter. Chapter 110. Hungry Python. Billy had to run off when they had all turned their back to see what the fabulous loot of news challenge. Delta stared in complete horror at the reward. 
she could just bloody hear the menu cackling. Look at the cool red sweater tops. Gammy gushed as she held hers out, admiring the spiderweb tops tied in the various flowers. Dio had his arm already, a vaguely orange delta symbol stitched onto the front of the breast, like some badge of honor only made it worse. I'll save mine for when I'm feeling like a black is too popular. Hamster said carefully, Mushy offered to carry and prevent the lad from being burdened. Poppy, now fully human and looking peaceful, hugged hers at the same emotional drain, let her just enjoy the moment. Grim eyed his. I feel like a target for wearing this, he mumbled. At least none of them got a purple bodysuit, empathic powers, and piloting skills. Delta mumbled. Then she perked up as she remembered something else. If Grim hits puberty before he leaves, then my dungeon will have grown a beard and I've made it. She fist pumped into the air. As annoyed as she was at the obvious red church joke, to be fair, Nu had weaved some subtle spider material into the top. It was going to lock arrows, but it was better than the average clothing. Dio waved his tusk sword with a flourish, having it catch somehow. Catch in on what? Before he managed to pull it out and they moved on to the room that Delta hadn't actually seen a proper action so far in her dungeon career. The fort room. A tremor ran through her entire dungeon. Delta frowned as it quickly subsided. It wasn't from below or inside. The tremor hit her from the side. Odd. That had shaken the land around her. Did Durance have earthquakes? Nothing else seemed to happen, so she watched as the goblin fort meet their intrepid challengers. Holly Dabagoth's sighs were black as the black thorn trees, their vengeance howling inside her being, the cataclysm of unbound human gluttony that destroyed her own her purpose, stood before her with baleful glory. Holly stabbed at the air when a mass of more browned wood and roots emerged from the ground, soaring into the sky with the bitch in its jaws. The corpse of the Blackthorn Forest, her dead home, had been woven into a creature of destruction, the rotting Dragon of Thorns. This was Holly's gift to the human known as Perhal. The foot fungus of Swamp Troll grunted as she barely managed to keep the jaws from ripping her meaty chunks. Holly did her best to push them shut. However, no normal person could do what Perhal the World Eater did. Holly's dragon cracked with a foe exploded out of the opening. Skin red and roaring mouth elongating into inhuman proportions, racing for Holly's throat. Pahal's gleaming white eyes contrasting Holly's cold and abyssal black ones. Holly roared in equal measure, and her body shifted. Her body, with all the curves and heft, was still the fine-tuned weapon that she had made it into. Her fist struck Pahal's jaw, and the woman was sent crashing into the clearing, leaving deep trenches in the earth. Holly leapt onto the dragon as it raced past her hull, and had already been standing upright as she inhaled. The air around her was suddenly violently sunk into the gaping maw, with an explosion of blood and flesh wings erupted from Holly's back. Deftly, Holly used a sudden surging torrent of air to dart forward, closing with the fiend before it could release its attack. The destructive sphere of pure pressure ripped through her dragon, making it explode. From the scattered carcass it started reformed, growing from bones wavering into the woods, the defiled and angry bones of her family, their wrath reviving Holly with all the power she needed. Her dragon crashed down fully healed before the attack even completed. The ball of compressed air would have crashed into Durance, but a barrier made up of seven shifting layers of struggling for a moment before dispersing the attack. Only seven, Holly was hoping the might would be closer to ten by now, but Delta was doing her best. Holly pointed a star for two more wooden dragon heads emerged from the ground. Her hole grinned at the sight. Holly swore to herself and she would make that smile turn to a scream. Pretty sure your sister managed five, her hole called conversationally. Holly's blood turned to ice. Then again, that's why she was sent to fight me while little Holly was sent to run. Makes sense. Perhal mused. Holly rushed in intent and crushing her throat with her own two hands. Perhal moved, sucking in the ambient forces, making her go from nearly fast to a blur. Holly saw the sky in her head smashing into the ground in the next moment. 
up a hole near Dunmouth in the terrace space. Her dragons rushed into, Pahal leapt back to avoid them, giving Holly some time to get to her feet. I don't think that you're going to be as fun to eat as Mistle. That sister of yours was the best thing in years. Pearl sighed. Holly couldn't hide a cry of anguish, as she perhaps too focused on her next attack. Something smashed into Pahal's face, and she screamed. The knight stumbled back as her face began to dissolve. Don't you dare make my Holly cry. A voice rang out. Pahal spun, her melting face struggling to reform as another flask hit the ground below her. Screaming, smoke boiled her whole skin. Holly saw her husband walking casually towards them. She felt fear and panic, but then she noticed something else. Her love's skin was golden. He, he had drunk in the potion. For her? Who, who do you think you are? Her whole voice was not amused anymore. Just a potion maker. But I am also Holly's husband, and I tend to not get involved when my wife has a goal. I love her independence, her wildness. But I won't stand by while you dare attack her in a way that she can't defend herself against. I am Kota, the man said calmly. Poor Hall's face went ashen. You are forbidden. You are not allowed to mess with affairs here and anywhere on this world, Poor Hall screeched. Kota usually behaves, but what can I say? My love does tend to surprise me with bouts of passion and nights of wild madness. Holly chuckled as she stood to her full height. Her love did really behave when he wanted. Their children did get their mischief from one of them. Holly Dabagast, the cursed druid, and Kota Dabagast, the man who had used a minor god as an ingredient for a potion. Holly just could never tell. Kota crunched his fist and a divine light engulfed per hull and the area around Durance flashed white. Mila turned a magazine and dog-eared a page with a type of scope made for brows. It had a dragon gloss and some auto aim enhancement on it. She was getting old. Having a bow do all the work wasn't bad, right? There was a flash as Kota's power exploded, briefly lighting the night. Mila sipped the tea calmly, not looking up as if the air howled past violently, making a mess. Well, there went the peace. They could expect the fallen crusaders of Hoisk now. The bloodthirsty meatheads would want Kota's head for revenge. She wished them luck. Most of them wrote poetry to the dead god, and it read horribly, like something Rudy had written when she was twelve. A couple walked past her, making out passionately, well, the one glowed with a godly aura, and the other a dark, bloody nature. Get a room, or a cave, or a godly plane, Mila griped. She did glance off into the distance where a skeleton whimpered as a flesh regrew and hatred bubbled. Where Pahal was alive, shame about that, despite the fact that Mila had asked that they hadn't killed any knights yet. Mila turned, and the runt that the knights had brought with them was staring. What? Mila snapped. The boy jumped and he looked out so shell-shocked that Mila did feel a little bad. Damn kids. While Mila wouldn't say that she wanted to be a grandmother, since the idea of Ruli spawning was enough to give Mila wrinkles, some instinct that Mila filled to smother him wanted to give the brat candy. Or something. How do you not kill each other? He whispered and Mila thought about it. Magical packs, deals, promises, blackmail, threats, and alcohol. Instead, we just make kids, or get apprentices, and make them fight. Less property damage, Mila grunted. Insurance claims were a curse that no one wanted to draw upon themselves. The boy just wandered off looking too scared to ask more questions. Mila twitched and, uh, with impeccable aim, tossed a piece of hard candy into his pocket. Without him noticing... Mila quickly went back to her Arrows for All Occasions magazine and went over the bows that could turn into different weapons. Some other things were really silly, but she couldn't deny that a bow that was also a scathe, that was also a stick to whack youngsters with, was somewhat appealing. The price was a bit grim, however. Bass was flapping his two long red sleeves as he enjoyed the gift immensely. He had no idea what was going on, but ever since he had stepped foot in the dungeon, he felt odd. What was the word? Odd? Maybe not, perhaps strange? 
Strange was better. The air seemed to make the sculpted flesh quiver, and the inner workings of his columnus were working like they feasted on the pure coffee beans. Magic coffee beans grown by stressed druids on a seasonal dandelions. He spun slightly and whacked Grimoire in the face accidentally. The sound made Vass giggle as he swished and swayed. Sounds! Vass was so alive that he could prove it. I think, therefore I pot, he announced, and he put some odd looks out of everyone's attention was drawn to the lone goblin standing at the edge of the wooden fort. Dirty surface breathers, I, the powerful and mighty Swa, welcome you to your death. The goblin cackled before a peaceful goblin whispered something to him. Death isn't PG, what? Fine, you're vaguely implied destruction. The goblin corrected himself. We vaguely take insult to that comment, Amster shouted. Don't yell over my speech, Swa, the goblin warned. Or what? Poppy asked with a small smile. Swa hefted something and threw it. A shoe of some kind. Vass watched the flying object fly and turn, almost hitting Grimm before he ducked. Vass picked up and decided that he would keep it. You get a boot to the head, Swa rumbled. The boot was made nicely and even had some sticky spider web to pull the sides tight and snug as it was some leafy pad for the boots itself. Why are you giving us a free boots? Dio asked confused. Because we're not allowed to shoot you in the face with fire arrows or explosive bombs because life is unfair. Swa roared and he threw another boot. Ah, is that the best you have? Grim smirked. The goblins finished and Vass watched as Grim's smirk also vanished when Boots started to fly over the walls. The best. You don't deserve the mighty Swa's best. I must be content with burning you with my insults. Underdeveloped adults. Nosy nose snot noses. Your curvy parent was a rodent and your hairy parent stinks of trollberries. Swa roared and the boots ignited into puffs of smoke projectiles. A stuffy pig made of pillows and stinking mushrooms came down next. This pig farts in your direction. Then that was followed by stools from the bar, and Vass stared in wonder as the goblins rolled down the hill, a familiar sight. Isn't that the giant clam? Vass pointed out, helpfully, as Grim shrieked and dove for cover. The clam angled itself and went over a slight bump and flew through the air, landing like a spinning coin on the rim of a very slightly bigger well to the side of the room. The clam dropped in and there was a splash below. After the clam, the goblins went quiet. Gemi went forward. I'd like to use up my pass to move on from here. She called up, waving her piece of paper that she'd gotten from the clam in the pond room. Swa stuck out his long nose over the edge and sniffed. It's legit, he called to the others. The goblins warned the others to stay back or they'd fire more boots. Vass heard the others tell her not to split the party or leave them, but Kemi strode forward. The gates opened, being let through. Behind the thing they saw her figure go into a hall before them as the goblins shrugged and went back to grinning as a group. Kemi then came running back out and jumped, lashing out with her legs to kick Swa and Billy off the ledge of the fort so that they would roll down the hill to the main group. I'll handle this one, Kemi yelled as she turned to the confused goblins with bandages over his hands. Vass was sure he was called numb. If I wasn't a dark evil necromancer, I'd totally have a crush on her, Amster said casually sighing a little as Dio pushed on. Not because you're a nerd and she's too cool for you, Poppy asked Riley. Poppy ruining goth. Yeah. I'll help, Cammy. Dio called and Vass trotted towards him, wondering how he would make it past the gate. Dio used his bare hands to punch the door and the wood cracked, torn asunder as the side slammed open. Dio went for his new sword, the tusky weapon getting stuck before Dio managed to get it free and pointing in the wrong direction. Vass supposed that he should help. He crouched and leapt, clearing the space in a single leap, as the red sleeves flapped like flags in the wind. He crashed down, and the serene goblin, known as Numb, did the same soft jabs as Kemi. I am a train to guard my master from various assassins, criminals, and people with clipboards wanting signatures. I will be your foe, Vass said, pleased with his sleeves dangling when he took his stance. 
Dio appeared to be swinging his tusk sword and completely missing as he flew down the hall. The chaos was immense as Grimm and Amminster took on Billy while Swa and Poppy squared off. Numb bowed once, let us enjoy Drali's senseless hand-to-hand combat, he said and Vass bowed as well. Vass lashed out with his leg and he was stopped with a double arm guard from Numb. The goblin's eyes were lighting up as he saw Vass wasn't boasting. They exchanged testing blows. A fist here, a sweep of the leg there, before Vass began to pick up speed. He leaned in, splitting the goblin's guard as he leapt over and briefly stunned form. Kemi stayed back, thankfully. Numb spun and Vass winced as he was sent staggering back from a roundhouse kick. He caught the goblin's next punch and pulled, yanking the goblin into his raised knee. That was when Dio appeared, his sword swinging on target. Num was forced to use one arm to block the tusk and another to catch Vass's foot. Feel the tusk of justice, Dio proclaimed. A wave of fire and ice filled the room, and Vass wasn't sure whether to shiver or cook. Feel the glory of fleeing, Dio added as Vass felt himself being dragged into the hall along with Kemi, as Num and Dio pulled them to safety. Looks like Swa has lost his temper, Num sighed. Poppy just lost her. Well, everything. She's a giant ice lizard, Dio pointed out. I would have lost, so you three can get the rest if you want. Num offered kindly as Vash shook his head. You were holding back. A lot, he pointed out as Grim, Billy, and Amonster rushed into the hall next to avoid being flash cooked or frozen. Num's smile was bright. I lost for what I was allowed to really do. That's the point. Num said as Grim shook as snow at his hair. Poppy needs to be told that she doesn't have to lose it and let it go all the time. I swear, she's got so into these things that she just loses her cool. He complained and Vance giggled at his joke. Since the fort room was just the steaming room now, they decided to go for the rest. The lady goblin, Lady Farrah, didn't look impressed, but fed them all stew, mushroom slices, and various fruits and even a selection of drinks. When the steam began to slowly enter the bar, Vera stomped out and returned with a frostbitten soir and a soot-covered poppy in each hand. Enough rabble-rousing, she warned the two. The two didn't seem angry. In fact, Vess thought that they looked friendly to each other. So, if we instill fire into an ice ball, Saw went on as if he hadn't been chastised. Poppy nodded. A much bigger boom. I liked the ruined thing that you did. I turned it inside out with my ice and it made more ice. Did you know that I could do that? Poppy asked. Tom the book was silently adding notes as they talked. It seemed that the book was catatonic from the new information that he was learning. Bass guessed that when one knew almost everything, anything new would be pretty awesome. He sipped a drink and Vass went still as his hair turned leafy and he grew branches. Delta surprise. Numb told Vass between bites of chicken. Vass just treed. Vass treed so hard. End of chapter. Chapter 111. Jack be nimble, Jack be. Oh no. Balta had to admit one thing. She felt a sense of amusement when Ferrer seemed to be eyeing each of the teens with a critical eye, giving them a warm soup and a burger with a side of mushroom rings, Extra portions, when no one was looking at her cooking through the kitchen window, set in the back of the bar. Dio and Poppy talked to the patient Num about their journey was going so far. Num was good with the kids. He nodded at the right bits and looked impressed when appropriate. Vass and Grimm were playing some dice game with Billy. Billy was utterly cheating with fixed dice, sleight of hands, and just plain luck. Poppy, Amster, and Kemi ended up talking with Swa about the benefits of fire. Delta wasn't sure she had known that each of them had their own favorite types, let alone the best kind to use per undead, holy being, or warm holiday hearth. Vera didn't even write down a tab, shaking her head as the charity she'd been running. Vera didn't even write down a tab, shaking her head at the, um, charity that she was running. She knew that challengers got a free meal before the boss. Data left them to it for a moment. She zoomed past the second floor, making sure that nothing terrible was going on. But it seemed as tame as the jungle was every really got. The third floor was quiet, and that was worrying. Lou appeared a second later. 
Not to be a bother, but we may have a thing. That is in... Oh, a thing. Or... Oh, a thing. Dalta asked slowly. A bit of both. Lovely. New led her on to the doors that led off to the circular garden. Dalta had even decided what to do with the old laboratory, and now she had to deal with something else. Life was never dull for a dungeon core, it seemed. Gargoyles had clustered around a large, dark iron door. The surface looked dented and damaged, but the unsettling thing, upon closer inspection, was that the dents extended towards them, like something was trying to get out. Her manner seemed to be pushing back against its straight line. That explained why she hadn't noticed it before. Her manner was her domain. Outside of it, things may as well have been unseen. Delta eyed it. She focused before she managed to stretch a weak mana line to it, and something inside her hand, an instinctual feeling of, uh, alien. She blinked and had to balance herself as if feeling echoed off of her very being. I see you felt it as well. What is that? Delta asked, and the gargoyles turned to more aggressive than the applied threat. I haven't a clue. We can't consume it or feel inside, so either it's a seal, a powerful enemy, or something else. I would just set everything on fire inside, but I have learned that the fire is neither hit or miss, or tends to make things worse. Don't let Swa hear you saying that, Dalton mumbled, and wondered what to do. If she needed to send something in, then they had to be able to work without a manner. I need Jack, she said seriously before feeling a slight nervous shake go through her body. Needing Jack was like needing a big red button. All other options had failed. Data appeared in the library as Jack sorted through the piles of trashy-looking books. He had some odd shrine in the corner of the room where a weird doll wore something that could be seen as a hideous dress robe or a bathrobe. The figure seemed to hold power over some rather well-made miniature books and a plush armchair. Honestly, it looked like some weirdo living in a basement surrounded by trashy smut and a comfy chair. All that was missing were the cats. Jack looked between two equally bad-looking books. Werewolves or ghost pirate husbands, he mumbled. He discarded the werewolf book. Rarity adds to the value, he decided. Jack, sorry to bother you in your, um, religious practices, Dartha said slowly. Jack turned with a toothy grin like a lizard-like face. Walking in on something you'd rather not see just adds to the spiritual vibe, to be honest, he explained. I prefer it when you blow things up, Dalta had to admit as she crossed her arms. Jack pulled out several glowing bottles. Give me a target, I'm a sinful sort, Jack cackled. The library around them seemed to be holding its breath, and Dalta knew the Libro Gollum was about ten steps away from booching Jack out for public indecency, with his books of choice and now was panicking at explosions. Dalta lured Jack away with a mission. Some needed breadcrumbs, others needed candy. Jack needed promises of destruction. The door was heavy and inside was gloomy. The first impression was that Jack didn't see anything that was worth blowing up. Honestly, this time was valuable and he walked in as the others watched from the open door. Being a contract gave Jack some benefits. He had to admit it. Being able to leave the dungeon space was one, obviously. The second was after a time that his bombs seemed to magically just reappear. That was the best part. The hallway ahead looked torn apart in several places. It was mostly stone and metal rivets. It looked more like the innards of some boat than the dwarf folk intended to make. Since they sank like rocks, they felt better being surrounded by metal of earth, and they had to travel the many flowing rivers of the world. Oddly, the pure metal seemed to be stained with old substances steered into the surfaces. Jack bent down and touched the black stains. It was too old for any clues, but Jack saw a pattern. Something had bled and several thick puddles over time. He narrowed his eyes as they seemed to make an almost stepping stone path over metal. Jack moved in. A dagger drawn, he felt Dalta's worry and slight connection. She was watching, so Jack had better perform at his best. The door at the end was torn apart from the inside. It was another dark metal door with several pieces looking blackened. Jack took a few steps forward, and the glowing symbols filled the hall. Hmm, well, bugger. Jack said calmly before he bolted. He ran as energy began to crackle in the space, turning the metal in the hall to a funnel of storm. 
Several metal spikes erupted from the floor and walls, intended to pierce something much larger than Jack. He moved between them. The energy, which had weirdly started at the exit of the hall, chased after him like a hungry beast. Jack had to begin using his blood path as a marker for where the spikes didn't pop up. He threw himself through the wreckage of the door and rolled to a stop. He kept still as he panted, quickly taking everything in. He had survived. More than three, no, definitely more than seven years down here. No stupid trap was getting Jackie boy. The room wasn't exactly looking any better than the hall. Tall apart creatures of metal and red stones lay scattered around. Some golem guards. Jack watched as the stones trembled. Some trembling energy filling them. They reassembled themselves into stone beetle golems, about the size of a human and a half. Six bending arms draw rapidly, reforming curved blades. They looked unsure of Jack, hence nothing more than two eyes and glowing yellow pits. Password? They spoke in unison, a choir of creepy stone bug gods. Well, Jack wasn't going to be rude. Password? He suggested. The yellow eyes turned to violent red. Incorrect. Attempts left zero. Jack held up one hand as he spoke, causing the guards to actually stop for a moment. I have a counter number for you. I have attempts left bombs, he declared. There was no movement or reaction. Jack threw the first of his vials, and the two statues were reduced to black and rubble. He grinned manically as the top half of the statues spun like a twister of steel and death. He scoffed at them. I don't fear death. He reached trash, Jack roared. Redstone and fire filled the chamber. Door gleamed before them. The glaring boar and the goblin inlay a warning. And an invitation. This is it, Grimm said quietly. He looked at the hand clasped on his shoulder. Don't be getting cold feet, Hamminster said. Grimm scoffed, shrugging off the other boy's hand. Hamminster was someone Grimm felt actually neutral towards. They were both dark horses of the group, and was potential for a friendship between them. But they both knew they'd rather be friends with Dio for different reasons. Kemi inhaled and cast the group blessing. May your strikes be true, she whispered. Grum nodded and pushed the doors open with both hands. They moved like a burden. It was as if the door itself was testing them, testing their strength to see if they were worthy to enter. It was different than before, and just barely. Grimm's strength was enough to open the door. Grimm felt like it was an ounce heavier. He would have failed. A dark and sandy arena greeted them. The previous cracks in the wall where the boss emerged had been replaced by a solid-looking opening that was too dark to see inside. Above them, a giant brazier ignited with a red fire, and a tinier copies around the edge of the circular cave lit up in sync, like a countdown, as they moved towards the far end. Mirrored perfectly, the braziers and each side gradually changed color, and further away they were until the blazing blue above the boss entrance. This is, uh, really cool. Kemi breathed. Obviously this must be her first time in this room. Grum didn't really get to appreciate it for himself last time, but it was nice. Challengers of the surface, welcome to the first trial. A deep rumble sounded out as the forms of Fran and Bacon emerged slowly from the shadows. The sleek armor and the dangerous-looking nons were only enhanced by the armored boar that the knight rode. Fran stopped his eye at them with a long look. Do you accept the challenge? He called. Grum looked at his team. Vass was placid and smiled. He looked amazingly happy, even after his tree thing had faded. Dio grinned excitedly. Poppy merely pushed her hood back to tear to meet Fran's eyes. He looked to the other side. Amster was looking utterly focused. Kemi inhaled once and her cheerful look with determination. I think we are. Are you, Grim called. Fran's smile wasn't arrogant or cruel. Merely excited. I was literally born ready, my wonderful challengers. Let it be known that as the first official team to enter my mother's dungeon, I will forever hold you in my heart as a special memory. I say this now, for whatever happens, be it a loss or a win, I wish nothing but success and pride in your personal journeys. Fran said as he bowed once. Grim bowed his own head. 
feeding his heart beat wildly in an intense energy and excitement. Now they all drew the weapons. Bran smiled. Sir Maestro, if you would. He called, and slow thrum echoed the walls. The beat was subtle, and it was pulsing in time with his heart. Ladies and gentlemen, others and between, those without terms and those with too many, are you ready to rumble with the number one, my popular vote hottest goblin to ever be? Place your bets, place your hopes, bet your dreams. Today, Team Hope of Tomorrow faces Fran, the Night Protector, beginning in ten seconds. The soulful voice announced that Grum wasn't sure about the team's name. Dio looked ready to protest too. The voice soaked into the very bones seemed to allow him to hear, as it were, Folks, it is time to d d d d d duel A bell sounded and Grum had no time to think about anything, neither how he finally felt finding where he belonged. Jack inhaled and coughed as he felt a few of his ribs had been broken. That's smart, he commented, and two remaining beetle guards moved towards him. One had only two arms and one leg left. The other was missing all of its lower half. The rubble around them was slowly moving, just slow enough to be missed if Jack wasn't so clever and keen-eyed. They were rebuilding themselves. Endless freaking wave of bug statues. It was stupid, but he reached out for the last ten bombs he had. These weren't exactly perfect. Three were gas and these things didn't breathe. One was a flashbang and they weren't affected by it. Two, he had no idea what they did and that was a bit of a pickle. He threw one at the statue burst into flower blossoms, making it look very pretty and it actually stopped to admire itself for all of five seconds. He threw the second one at the golem shuddered before a clone of itself split off like some sort of slime. They shared a look and nodded, resuming the walk towards Jack. Oh, well, that was my fault, he admitted, as he leaned back against the old brickwork inlaid with more bands and iron metal. Jack eyed them, still cackling the hallways. Escape wasn't this option. I need something right now, Jack admitted. He wasn't eager to die again. It cost Alta a pretty penny to bring him back. Damn it, Jack needed a miracle. He needed some asphalt or something like a swordfish. A swordfish, Jack frowned. He needed a what? The golems froze and promptly collapsed into a messy pile of rocks and inert metal. Jack turned to see a giant thing standing in the frame of the previously closed door. A giant red thing with curved horns and a snarling face. Next to that thing was a metal skeleton wearing a weird apron. Master, the bipedal gecko lives. Shall I correct that? The skeleton clacked and the demon shook its massive head. No. He replied, and Jack was liking the demon. We can harvest his blood for materials over time. He added. Jack corrected himself. He really liked the demon. Hello, I am the diplomat for Delta, the dungeon core. Who is your neighbor? Jack waved and jerked as he forgot about his ribs. The demon wore a giant leather kilt, filled with tools, and his muscular frame was bulky, but not an inch of fat could be seen anywhere. It speaks without permission. I shall remove its tongue and pickle it, the skeleton said promptly, only for the demon to pull it back. Robin, calm yourself. Are you qualified to barter treaties between powers? The demon asked skeptically. Jack had to be honest. I am an expert in the dungeon, he promised solemnly. Delta was cheering in his head. Jack felt better knowing that she was yelling in support for so long that he must have broken some record. Jack liked blowing things up. Bombs or boring planning. He wasn't picky. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this batch video. If you wish to support the author or this channel, the links are down below. And, as always, I'll see you in the next chapter. Have a good one. Cheers.